I'm Cheryl Hendry, CEO of Brand Tailors, and you're watching Facets Television. Welcome, you're watching Facets Television, and I'm Kevin McDonald. With me today is Judge Jim P. Gray, and Judge Gray is a 25-year retired Superior Court judge here in Orange County. Beyond being a 25-year judge in our Superior Court, he's also an author, an advocate for many changes in our laws, including the decriminalization of marijuana, among other things. Judge. Great, thank you so much for coming in today. I really appreciate your joining us. It's nice um, to be with you. Appreciate the opportunity to discuss these various issues. In fact, uh, you mentioned drug policy. I think it's probably the most critical issue facing our country today. And I go around and speak to Rotary clubs, religious groups, whatever, and say, and it's true, that drug policy is the biggest failed policy in the history of the United States of America, second only to slavery. We couldn't do it worse if we tried. So it's nice to be able to expand on some of those things. Well, let, let's get right into that then. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who believe that the drug drug use is a scourge on our country, and the, it's counterintuitive to discuss legalizing or decriminalizing drugs. Why don't you break down for me, as a judge who's been a prosecutor, who's been on the justice side of all of this, supposed to justice side of all of this for so long, give us a little bit of insight into why you've come to the position sure. you have. You know. We're facing two problems in our world today. One is drug harms, and I'm not going to minimize them. They can be dangerous. They certainly can be severe. But the second is drug money harms, and those are far worse than the drug harms themselves. You know, I look at folks. Ask, ask kids, because most people realize what we're doing isn't working, but they will continue with this failed policy for all of its defects, quote, unquote, in order to keep our children away from this lifestyle and the usage of drugs. So ask our kids, ask young people under the age of 21 like I do all the time, if I were to give you $50 in cash right now, how many of you could come back with $50 worth of marijuana or any other drug if you want to? That's the key. Uh, and they all raise their hands. Or have it delivered for that matter. Or have it delivered. So it's easier for young people today to get marijuana or ecstasy or whatever than it is beer. Why? Because the alcohol is regulated and controlled by the government and the illegal drugs are controlled by illegal drug dealers and they don't ask for ID. Secondly, we are putting our children in harm's way, Kevin, for a really important reason. And I was on juvenile court and would see this almost daily. Ask yourself the question, if I'm an adult drug dealer, how much risk taking can I buy for $50 in cash from a 14, 15, 16 year old boy or girl in any town or city? And the answer is quite a bit. You know, $50 is nothing to an adult drug dealer, but it's a lot of money to a kid. Okay, so then I use them as, lo as gophers, lookouts, couriers, whatever. And then as night follows day, as soon as their reliability is established, I trust them to go out and sell small amounts of drugs in the communities. Why would I do such a scurrilous thing? The answer to that is easy. More money for me, more money for the kid. And less risk. Ask you this question. Mm -hmm. If you have a 15-year-old selling drugs in his or her community, who is he or she going to sell to? Us? Nonsense. They're going to sell to their 14, 15, 16-year-old peers, thus recruiting more children to a lifestyle of drug usage and drug selling, which ostensibly is what exactly we're trying to keep away from them, and it's caused by drug prohibition. Well, let's get into that issue, because I, I'm disturbed, frankly, by the fact that we have changed as a society to the point where we keep chasing younger and younger the, the uh, point at which we're willing to say a kid is responsible for their decisions and their actions, regardless of who's influenced them or how they got where they are. And we've given up on trying to do anything to straighten them out. We basically say, 12 years old, we're going to try as an adult, throw you away. Um, it's been I, happening. A lot of it's been part of the, I mean, it seems to me the drug war is largely responsible for that because they use them as couriers and they, they use do. them as, you know, violence. They do. Or, or they get involved with violence. They right. carry guns and the rest. You know, we've become a punitive society. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, 
we have adopted the approach that incarceration is the way to go. And we lead the world in the incarceration of our people, both by sheer numbers as well as per capita. And here I assure you, we're number one does not make me proud. The United States has about 5% of the world's population and 25% of its prisoners. So there's, we've got to be doing something wrong. In fact, as Senator uh, Webb from Virginia said, either we are the most evil people in the world or we're doing something wrong. And I think that he's right. And, you know, I think, too, um, let's get to that subject. In California, we have a massive prison overpopulation problem. Um, and there are real crimes occurring. There are violent sex crimes. There are assaults, murders, robbery, et cetera. Sure. Um, Many of the people would claim that this is related to drug use. What's your response to well, that? Well, a lot of it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go and talk with the felony trial court judges in our county, or Los Angeles, and they will tell you, like they tell me, that about 80% of our felony crime is drug-related crime. Now, half of that is drug crime. That is, possession with intent to sell, conspiracy to sell, the violence that goes on for me to protect my fiefdom against you that are trying to corn in. But the other half is caused by, in effect, the artificially high cost of these drugs, char cost by people who are trying to get the money to buy the drugs. The burglaries, the prostitution, the purse snatchings, uh, that's, that's part of the problem. That's a drug money problem. And you look at Mexico. I mean, Mexico, Colombia also, they don't have drug problems as such. They have overwhelming drug money problems. And today, of course, we get very arrogant with Mexico saying, you should do more to resolve our drug problems. And of course, those are the people that are dying. And it's caused, not by drugs, has nothing to do with drugs. Mm -hmm. It's everything to do with drug money. And that's the major problem. Yeah, it's all, the tra it's all around the transaction. That's right. If we look at the prison overpopulation just by itself, to me, uh, there was a recent st story last year, not recent, about eight months now, um, where prisoners were released because of overcrowding, uh, overcrowding. And in fact, a federal judge ordered that another many thousands be released. Right. San Francisco. Um, in all honesty, we know with three strikes, which is another thing we can talk about a little bit into this discussion, but between three strikes and the drug laws, we're basically pushing out people that are already in jail for other much it's more true. significant crimes. It's true. To make room for people that are doing more petty crimes. Focus on it this way. And I wrote a book called Why Our Drug Laws Have Failed, and I'm writing on a, a new edition right now. And in that, I showed statistics from the federal government that we were twice as successful in 1980 in prosecuting homicides as we were in 1990. Why? Because the Reagan administration yet again ratcheted up the war on drugs, prosecuting no more nonviolent drug offenders. As a result, understand, and I've been in the criminal justice system almost all of my professional life, we only have so many resources. So the tougher we get with regard to the prosecution of drug crime, the softer we get with regard to the prosecution of everything else. You know, robbery, rape, and murder are not nearly as well prosecuted now because we are out chasing off after uh, drug offenders. Mm -hmm. and, and those are problems. It doesn't mean that we don't hold people accountable for their actions, but the, the truth is on this thing. It makes as much sense to put this gifted actor Robert Downey Jr. in jail for his heroin problem, and he's doing real well now and I applaud him, but he'll always have that craving. He'll always be a recovering heroin addict, so he, he should be careful. But it makes as much sense to put him in jail for his heroin problem as it would have Betty Ford in jail for her alcohol problem. It's the same thing, Kevin. It's a health issue. but. If Robert Downey Jr., Betty Ford, you or I drive a motor vehicle while impaired by, you fill in the blank. Methamphetamines, alcohol, heroin, cocaine, that's different. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Now by their actions, they're putting our safety at risk. That's a legitimate criminal justice function. So let's go to that point about the, the jailing. I mean, if you, you know, people have said, oh, you know, it's, it's bad for neighborhoods and so on and so forth. Um, we have a lot of people in jail for marijuana laws, and as I understand it, it's something like 800,000 a year arrests are, are directly Nationwide, towards Nationwide, we have one we have one arrest for marijuana offenses every 23 seconds, and 80 percent of those are for simple possession. Right. That's nationwide. Now, the state, we have changed in California. In fact, Governor Schwarzenegger recently signed a, a piece of legislation that said now it's an infraction. It's basically like a speeding ticket. But we still put people, today, literally, what's this, 2011, we have 
thousands of people in state prison in California that did nothing but smoke marijuana in prison. Why? Because for one reason or another they were on parole. And always as a condition of parole you will use no form of illicit substances. And then, I agree stupidly, they go to a party on a Friday night, smoke some marijuana, and now it'll stay in their system for up to 30 days, be detectable by drug treat, by drug testing. As a result, they don't show up for their drug test, boom, they're back in prison. They do show up, boom, they're back in prison, costing the taxpayers about $30,000 a year, putting their families back on welfare, losing their jobs, everything else. It's really stupid, mm -hmm. and that's what we're doing. Yeah, and, and you know, from the experience of years of knowing marijuana users, and anybody in California who says they don't know any, um, you're oh, either that's, in that's denial or you're lying. Um, the and fact they know is people that who use cocaine, too, for the right. same reason. You just don't, may not know who they are, but they're out there. That's true. But in the case of marijuana, I mean, you don't see the violence. You don't see the, the physical abuse of, of family and children amongst no, pot right. smokers. Um, yes, I'm sure there are some traffic accidents related to marijuana, but in comparison to the alcohol, they can't even be in the same universe. So what is it, do you think, that's so wrong with the thinking in society that keeps us from realizing that this is all BS, it's a big game to keep a big industry in play because let's get to the law enforcement industry as part of this deal. And I am not a proponent at this point of dealing with the more uh, hardcore drugs as far as de uh, decriminalization. I think we need de to deal with them in a very different way and I haven't figured that out. But from the, let's just stick with pot for a minute. You cannot tell me that there is a reason why one person who smokes something that came out of the ground and another person who puts a distilled liquid in their body one is going to commit violence, another is going to eat Twinkies. Which one should be in jail? I mean, well, let's be realistic. Again, the answer is to hold people accountable for what they do as adults. But mm -hmm. you go and talk about marijuana. Uh, it's the largest cash crop in the state of California today. In fact, we had Proposition 19 on the ballot, uh, and I tell people, uh, I was actually on the ballot statement. I, I was certainly a proponent of it. It passed. Proposition 19 to treat marijuana like alcohol passed. but we're going to delay implementation for two years. That is to say, in two years, on the 2012 ballot in the general election, the presidential election, there will be another initiative on the ballot, and it's going to pass. Uh, because we got enough mainstream discussion. People were taking this seriously. Yes, I agree, Prop 19 had some, some defects within it. I was involved with numbers of debates where even chiefs of police would say, I don't have any problem with regulating and distributing marijuana for adults, but Prop 19 gives me some troubles. So we're going to address those issues, and, and basically it's going to be there. Uh, people are going to see that there's violence going on in Mexico. 50% of the drug cartel's gross revenue comes from the sale of marijuana. Uh, they're going to see the bad things that happen there. They're going to see that it's easier for kids to get hold of that than, than alcohol. Mm -hmm. And they're going to understand, you know, the Mexican drug cartels are not raising vineyards in our national forest to compete with Robert Mondavi. You know, we can chase them out of this business, and we will. And then let me suggest to you, the country of Portugal, and I think our media has let us down, Portugal in 2001 decriminalized all drugs, all drugs. Just this is for your information. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's in my new book. Uh, actually, you have it there. Yeah, the new book handbook. is uh, Judge Gray's book, A Voter's Handbook and Effective Solutions to America's Problems. It is. <laughs> Thank you for that. But, you know, we discuss numbers of things. And Portugal, they found that it did not increase drug usage at all. And all these people that say, oh, if we were to change our approach, we'd become a nation of drug zombies. I mean, it's silly and insulting. In Portugal, it didn't happen. Drug usage, if anything, went down about a tenth of a percent, but problem drug usage went down by 50 percent. Why? Well, cause today in our country, if you're a problem user, you're not going to bring your problems to the government. Why? Because the government will punish you, so you take them underground. But yeah. now, in Portugal, they do that, and since the government is not spending all of this money on the investigation, prosecution, incarceration of these people, they have money for drug treatment, and problem drug usage has gone down by 50 percent, and children are no longer in such numbers going down this road. Why? What do I want to take drugs for and it's go see a doctor? Anymore, yeah. That's no fun. Yeah. No glamour in that. Yep. And they're doing elsewhere. Yep. So these are things that we need to look at. And further, Switzerland, heroin usage is a medical problem where you can go to a medical clinic in Switzerland, get a prescription for heroin, 
which by the way is artificially expensive. If it's pharmaceutical prices in Switzerland, a maximum of ten dollars a day is enough to sustain even the heaviest using drug addicted mm -hmm. person. Versus and fifteen hundred, right? That, and that's yeah. well a lot. Two yeah. hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollars a day. Yeah. And I've seen them, of course, they're burglars and and we don't have money for drug treatment, so we put them in prison, which is much more expensive. Right. But their lives are better. They're living normal lives. They're supporting their children. Mm -hmm. uh, they're off crime because if they're even arrested, they're off the program. It's working. We should do similar things here. We can, and eventually, I guarantee you, any of our listeners, anyone that wants to talk about this, two years after we change away from this failed policy of drug prohibition, all of us will link arms, look back, and be aghast that we could have perpetuated such a failed system for so long. So for those of the, those that don't know you, um, many people would think you must be a liberal. Why don't you, I'm a libertarian. Why don't you, them out? you know, I was former federal prosecutor. You know, I was a Navy JAG attorney. Uh, I went to USC Law School. Yes, I was in the Peace Corps, and I'm proud of it in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. Puedo hablar español como la gente. But, uh, you know, from a standpoint of being a veteran trial court judge, you can talk to almost any judge privately. Publicly, they may be different, but privately, they almost all agree what we're doing isn't working. Mm -hmm. Now, they may have various thoughts about where to go from here, but they realize that we are not making it with our children. The drug money problems are huge. We're not getting any better. For example, I became a judge in the municipal court in Santa Ana uh, in 1983, and I was appointed to that position. A fellow who held the job before me, for reasons still unknown to me, no longer wanted to be a judge, and he resigned. That fellow, former Judge Alan Playa, has since then served a 20-year prison sentence for being involved in a cocaine distribution uh, conspiracy. I have no reason to believe that former Judge Alan Playa was a bad man. I'm here to tell you that his resistance was overcome by the allure of free and easy big money involving drugs. If it happens to someone like that, how often does it happen to our children? How often does it happen to people uh, with the INS uh, guarding our borders, uh, police officers, and all the rest of this sort yeah, of thing? Yeah, and in the, the economy we're in right now, people. Huge. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, people it's are huge. struggling, and if and I, I don't make any moral judgment on the point is if there's money in front of you and there's no jobs, and you you got to weigh the gamble. I, make I, mean, a moral I could go judgment, to jail. I could, you know. But I mean, wouldn't like, it be better not to have a system that so strongly encouraged people to violate the law? Right. And that's what we're doing to our children. Right. That's what we're doing to our to fellow mankind. Afghanistan, 50% of their gross revenues in Afghanistan comes from what? The opium poppy. We'll never, ever beat it. So let's understand it. And like in Europe, they understand that it's here to stay. The drugs, harmful as they can be, are here to stay. So instead of moralizing about it, which we're really good at, they manage the problem. And they re reduce the harms that can and will be caused. They have needle exchange programs, which they should have. All of the studies, Kevin, show that needle exchange programs, which basically people exchange a dirty needle for a clean one, no money changes hands, no questions mm -hmm. are asked, period. They decrease the usage of, or the incidence of AIDS, hepatitis C, and all that blood-borne diseases by 50% yeah. and are neutral with regard to drug usage. They don't decrease it or increase it either. We should have needle exchange programs. Today in California, it's a violation of law for you or me to possess a hypodermic needle and syringe without a doctor's prescription, and it's illegal for the doctors to prescribe it unless you need it for insulin or for various other things like that. Right. It's stupid. So what's the next move? You say that, that you see the proposition coming back. It will be on um, the ballot. We're working on it. I was working on it today. You know, okay. We're working on the language uh, for adults. It will not affect any laws regarding driving under the influence. Drugs and alcohol or, or excuse me, a marijuana in the workplace or anything like that. Certainly not with regard to any child's usage cell, et cetera, uh, under 21 years of age. Mm -hmm. But it will allow a system uh, for the, the government to allow it to be regulated, controlled, taxed, uh, and it will pass. Well, I would argue, actually, as a, an expert in, in HIPAA privacy and security, that, um, frankly, it is already a violation um, for an employer to deal with the issue that if, if a person has a medical marijuana prescription, it's none of your business at this point. And that's right. And, and, so it, and that's correct. I, I'm waiting for that lawsuit to happen where somebody realizes, sure. hey, wait a minute, this is my medical privacy. Whether you sure. have a moral judgment on that or not doesn't matter. The law says it's medical. Medicine is covered under federal and state law, and, and in fact, so is uh, substance abuse. So I'm interested to see. Well, that. we'll treat marijuana like alcohol. Mm -hmm. And you know, you or I tonight, after this show, could go home and drink 11 martinis. Mm -hmm. I'm not smart, 
yep. uh, certainly not healthy, but as long as we don't beat up our spouse or drive under the influence, it's not a violation of law. And basically, I am a libertarian, I'm proud to say. It makes as much sense to me to say that the government has the right to control what I put into my body as it does what I put into my mind. It's none of their business. I it's agree. just none of their business. What do you think about the people who are saying that, that um, marijuana has become stronger, it's addictive? Right. I mean, what's your uh, response to, to... Marijuana has become stronger. Mm -hmm. But the cardinal rule of prohibition, see this is the fault of our prohibitionary laws, is to always to push the stronger stuff. Example, we're now back in alcohol prohibition and I'm a bootlegger. I will run into the same criminal justice sanctions for selling a, bar a barrel of beer as a barrel of bourbon, right? Yep. Same deal. But which am I going to push? The, the bourbon. Why? I make more money. Yep. As a result, I'm now selling marijuana. Well, first of all, I'd much rather get you on cocaine or methamphetamines. I get more money and it's easier to hide. But even putting that aside, I run into the exact same criminal justice risks for selling strong marijuana as weaker marijuana. So a lot of people would prefer to have weaker marijuana for various reasons. It's not available because the pushers always push the stronger stuff. It's so, caused by drug prohibition. So what do you think about um, the, the claim that there's uh, a gateway the occurrence here? It's been exploded. Mm -hmm. You know, I agree that most people that use methamphetamines, cocaine, the harder drugs, used marijuana along the way. I think that's fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, they used cigarettes. Before that, they used alcohol. And most of them, 90% of the people that use marijuana never go on to use other drugs. They stop at marijuana. So you can trust, you can trace that stepping stone theory back to mother's milk if you want to, but all of the studies show that that's simply not true. So, so basically what you're saying is that, that they've debunked that as their studies. Yes. I haven't seen them, so are there studies yes. that actually show I that? I quote them. They're from Yale University, University of Chicago, Centers for Disease Control, mm -hmm. uh, all of these various people. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it's just simply not true. So now what are you, on the young people side, um, I've seen over the years that, that it's like the moving ball. As, as the society figures out, ecstasy was legal for, for quite some time. I mean, mm -hmm. many things that have become illegal, um, once they find out that the kids are using it, suddenly they make it illegal. And the kids just move to something else that's usually like more harmful than what you and now made illegal. Too. I mean, we have huffing and we have... You can't even buy spray paint in the state of California anymore because of the tagging and the huffing, com, you know, I heard a story markers. And, and I couldn't trace it down, so I didn't put it in my books. But the story was about this small town in Australia in the outback. And basically, it might as well have been an island because it was surrounded by desert. And the people in charge decided, you know, we can control what comes into our town. We're going to keep all illegal drugs out. And you know what happened? Pretty soon, because we want to protect our children, pretty soon you saw these kids going around town with soup cans or with strings around their neck. Why? They found out they were sniffing gasoline. You know, if you want to get a high, I assure you, sniffing gasoline is a really quick way to do it. Of course, it kills your brain cells and you'll have a headache like you won't believe. But what are you going to do, make gasoline illegal? Mm -hmm. If some people want to find these things, they will. Chainsaws are very dangerous. You want to make chainsaws illegal? Gasoline illegal? You know, there comes a time when you simply have to recognize that it's there and people, if they want to do it, they can. If they will, I would much prefer that they use the natural substances like marijuana, even cocaine or heroin if it comes down to it, than methamphetamines, PCP, the synthetic stuff, because if anything, that's even worse. Right, because they've been genetically or chemically constructed you to have no to have concept impact. of what yeah. you're putting into your body. Yeah. And, you know, Heroin, for all that I, I don't mean to, to say it's not dangerous because it is, but it's not a killer. It's the unknown strength of the heroin that will kill people. It's the impurities, the unknown quality. And really important, Kevin, lots and lots of young people and others die because it's illegal. Why? Not only the strength and the purity, but now if you're at a party and one of your friends is using drugs and starts to go into medical trauma, medical problems, they hesitate to get medical health yeah. because it's illegal and they wait that extra 15, 20 minutes, which is crucial because they don't want their friend to get in criminal justice problems. They, yep. they don't want them to either. That's why And they think they're die. helping and they end up, they end up right. killing them or themselves it's as a, a result. It's a killer and it's caused by drug prohibition. So let's get into the discussion about mandatory minimums. Um, this disaster. is something that, that has, in my opinion, hmm. has been a disaster on many levels, but um, because the unintended consequences. Can, can you give me a couple of really horrible examples of, sure. as a judge, where you felt this is just not justice? Well, I have not had them in my courtroom because 
after 1992. See, I held a press conference back in 1992 as a sitting judge saying what we're doing isn't working on drug policy and we have to go to options. And at that point, politically, it was just not probable to, for me to be there. So, right. so I haven't had any, but I've, I can talk lots about them. You know, I, well, I did. I did in my courtroom when I was on the abused and neglected children calendar in juvenile court, I would have the following scenario come into my own department about maybe every two or three weeks. You'd have a mother, let's call her a single mother of two, make a big mistake. Namely, she'd hook up with the wrong boyfriend. And the boyfriend was selling narcotics, and she'd basically know it, but okay. One fine day, he'd say, well, tell you what, Sarah, if you take this package and take it across town and give it to Charlie, I'll pay you $500. And she'd basically know it con contain narcotics, but you know, I need the money, I'm going that way anyway, so she'd do it. Okay, so she gets caught, arrested, prosecuted, and sentenced to prison for five years. Mandatory minimum sentence, judge has transporting, cocaine of that amount, three ounces or so, it's not an unreasonable sentence, has to put him in, in prison. Okay, ask yourself the question, if the mother is in prison, what happens to the children? Well, that question's easily answered. She has legally abandoned her children, so they come to me on the abused and neglected children calendar. Mm -hmm. I look at her and say, you know, unless you're lucky and either have a close personal friend or family member that's both willing and able to take custody of your children, she's, they're gonna be adopted but for the next, in, within a year and you're never gonna be involved with them again. And she starts to dissolve in tears. Now, if that's not enough, I can get the taxpayers to dissolve in tears also, because it's gonna cost the taxpayers upwards of $5,000 per month per child to keep them in a group home until they're gonna be adopted. And in the foster system, I, I think the statistic that I saw recently was over 90% of the kids in the foster system uh, don't graduate they're going to follow the footsteps don't go to of college, their parents. They get They're going to end up in the, prison. Yeah, I mean, it's a disaster. The st statistics are and that pathetic. is also caused by drug prohibition. Right. You know, we, you just civil liberties. You know, I have a whole chapter in my book, Why Our Drug Laws Have Failed, about the loss of civil liberties because of drug cases. Are we in better shape today because we've lost all of our civil liberties? No, but you trace them, even the United States Supreme Court cases, it's a disaster. Where's Paul Revere? Because if you lose your civil liberties to the government, you almost never get them back. Right. Health, yeah. corruption, violence, yeah. wars, all of this sort of stuff. Uh, we took out Manuel Noriega, remember him, president of Panama, with a war. Mm -hmm. I mean, we went in, we declared war, took him out. He's now in Marion Federal Prison, as far as I know. More drugs are coming through that area uh, than ever before. It doesn't matter. It doesn't stop them. It's the money. You cannot repeal the law of supply and demand, Kevin, as you know. And yeah. if you have somebody here in Costa Mesa, Newport Beach, or anywhere else in the world holding up a $50 bill on a street corner, figuratively saying, somebody provide me with $50 worth of cocaine, marijuana, or whatever, I guarantee you that someone will supply it. And as soon as we arrest them, and we arrest plenty of people doing this, basically the stupid ones, the dumb ones, the ones that are more public about it, leaving this phenomenally lucrative area for people that are more organized, more violent, and, and tougher. Mm -hmm. And they appreciate it, by the way. It's a, surprise, it's a surprise support for them. So it will always be here. You arrest somebody on a street corner, seven people within 30 minutes are gonna be there taking this place. So have, has there been consideration about um, after the fact because we still have a problem with a very large number of people in, in the, the hundreds of thousands that are in our prisons um, that are there for minor drug offenses or transporting that I still, again, if it's marijuana, yes. I'm sorry guys, I don't get it. I don't, I don't see the difference. If you, if you wanna do this, then we should go back to alcohol prohibition and be consistent. Otherwise, children are smart and children look at adults as if, okay, I've seen alcohol, I've they seen what it does. Hypocrisy. I try pot, yeah, you look like a fool when you stand in front of a child and sure. you say, it's worse. Show sure. me how. Well, Someone please first show of me all, how. I don't agree with you. If you're gonna transport marijuana, sell it for money, yeah. because it's illegal, I'm gonna put you in jail. I'm right. gonna put you in prison, but Get I'm gonna it. try to change the system so that that's not so strongly encouraged. So, right. so that's something that we well, need to look Well, that's my point, at. is that the reason that that's happening is because Absolutely. it's illegal. And if, if we were in the position where those that wanted um, the small amount that they may want, and in fact, you know, I'm wondering, is are there any statistics at this point for since the medicinal marijuana has come out on the lessening of the impact on the criminal justice system. Have we seen any real numbers on that yet? Um, I, I can't answer that question. Okay. I can tell you that Los Angeles, of course, 
through a failure of, of regulation, all of a sudden looked around a while ago and found, oh, look at all these supposed medical mar marijuana dispensaries. And a lot of them were violating the law. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, if that's the case, prosecute them. Yeah, because the law is regulatory and it is And that's criminal. right. Yeah. But, so they closed down a bunch of them. That did not decrease the amount of marijuana sold in that area. It simply pushed it underground again. You right. know, no regulations, no controls, no taxes. It's still there. Uh, today, marijuana, again, is the largest cash crop in the state of California. A number two is grapes, by the way. So it's here. Let's regulate it, control it, tax it, and get the thugs out of it. And that's, again, what we need to do. Now, what do we have to, how do we respond to one of the things that was brought up to me um, was the interstate commerce issue and the fact that if California get, find, finds its brain, in my opinion, and deals with the marijuana issue, because I still haven't made up my mind how to deal with the other stuff. Okay. I've seen the devastation with people that I know. Read my um, book, Kevin. I'm, I'm, you, I'm going you'll to change your mind. C count on it, but but from the mar even if we stuck with just the marijuana side for this moment, it is completely irrational to me to destroy a person's future. Because if you take a young child and you give them a drug use record, and as a person who's involved in you know uh, DoD accounts and security and computers, I'm a I'm a senior advisor to the Orange County Sheriff's Department on technology because I'm clean and I because I didn't choose to use drugs and I didn't but that to me having a 15 year old child who smokes some pot and then saying to them as an adult you're basically less of an adult less of a valuable person because of choices that you made to consume pot versus alcohol if they get arrested for alcohol they send them home put it this way you can look, uh, children recognize hypocrisy. Look at all of our elected officials that for one way or another have been found to have been using illegal drugs. Start with President Obama. I read his book. You know, he acknowledged in his book that he had used cocaine and marijuana. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger, Gov President Bush, you know. And President Bush, you talk about some hypocrisy. When he was governor of Florida, signed some legislation mandating anyone who uses these drugs must go to prison, must go to jail for a minimum of 180 days. And if he were here today, I, re I respect him as a man, but I would ask him, would it have helped your career? Would it have been a beneficial thing for you to have gone for jail? Because he did grow days? up, right? You know, he grew well, up to be the right. leader of the free world. And the thing, you know, <laughs> I'm a child of the '60s. I've yeah. never used any illicit substance. You know, yeah. I just I'm not interested. I don't smoke cigarettes. I'm worried about my cholesterol, for heaven's sake. But it astounds me the hypocrisy that our generation has put our children in jail for doing the same thing that we did when we were their age. And See, that's, never that was one of my that. biggest points about the, the, the disregard for the mistakes that children make. Yes. The, the, and which, what's so ironic is to me, if you want to say some of the worst actors, the people that were involved in the civil rights movement and heavy drug use and free love and all these things that we see on TV sure. today, and I'm thinking to myself, these same human beings are the ones who turn around and say, turn their back on when their own child ends up in prison for something. I mean, cannot, it just doesn't make any sense. I cannot explain that. Yeah. Uh, I look, I go and speak with uh, uh, churches where people of color are, minorities, uh, blacks, Hispanics, whatever, and I look at them and say, you know, I'm aghast that it does not take a sociologist to go through any jail or prison in our country and see that people that look like you are overrepresented. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, if they looked like me, we wouldn't stand for this. We would have changed this failed system years ago. Why are you so quiet? Right. And a lot of people think it's racist. And honestly, uh, the roots of all of these laws of prohibition go back to racism. You know, with cocaine, it's basically black males. We're afraid are going to lead our wi white women astray. Opium, it Clearly, was Chinese. Opium you know, was yep, Chinese. Yep. Marijuana was those Mexicans. We didn't even know what marijuana was. We certainly didn't know that we were making the whole hemp industry il uh, illegal, right. which was a disaster in itself, and we can bring back From that. a variety of reasons, For right? For all yeah. kinds of re Economic, we could revitalize the whole Northwest United States. You can get s four times the amount of paper pulp from an acre of hemp as you can an acre of trees. It takes a season of seven or eight months to grow the hemp and 20 years to grow the trees. We can revitalize. We are importing a billion dollars worth of hemp products from Canada every year. Uh, they're very happy with it. We're, it's a self-inflicted wound. We're, we're, last I looked, we're having some budget and tax deficits mm -hmm. here. Re-legalize re the hemp industry and we'll do better. So folks, for folks like me that, that are strong law enforcement proponents. Like me. Right. So how, how, do, you, how do you help people to align those two? Because I mean, I'm probably one of the strongest pro-law enforcement people you're sure. going to see, but this still disturbs me on a level that 
as it's well as it to should. Deal with, so. Understand the tougher we get with regard to drug crimes, literally the softer we get with regard to the prosecution of everything else. Ask people, have you ever been involved with a burglary? Have you? Mm -hmm. House or car? Yeah. A lot of people will say yes. What happened? You call the police. They come eventually. Then what happens? They prepare a police report. Then what happens? In today's world, that is not used for investigation. You take the report and give it to your insurance company. Right. Wouldn't it be better, instead of chasing all of these drug offenses, to actually pursue the burglaries, you know, the robberies, and the white-collar crimes? And you would think would be supportive of that, too. I just think that's the thing that seems to be Privately, they're getting closer. Yeah. Publicly, you know, and the prison guards union, of course, is ecstatic about this. Well, they're making billions. That, you know are. what? I'll tell you what we're going to do. I could keep going on this and other issues. So I would really like to have you back um, Happy and, to. and get more into the libertarian discussion sure. and some of the other issues of the industry of prisons and so in on. In the meantime, so you know, and I'd like to maybe I get in a plug. I, I've written a musical. Uh, it's called Americans All. It's a, for high school kids to show them that life is, is really wonderful. And it's, it's fun. It's going to be performed by Vanguard University in the last three weekends in September. Uh, and I just ask your, you and ask you to come and, and your, your viewers as well. Uh, there terrific. are a lot of good things going on and this I'm really proud of. Uh, and of course you can also get all the answers from my book. But libertarian philosophy does work most well, of we the need time. To, we need to talk more. Thank you we'll so much it. for coming in. I appreciate it. Pleasure. I'm Kevin McDonald. You're watching Facets Television, and you can get Judge Gray's book, A Voter's Handbook, Effective Solutions to America's Problems, and we'll see you again later.